VIU Online presents GEC 101 English Composition, Week 5 Theoretical Lecture, The Fundamentals of the Language Process. This lecture is presented by Dr. Laura Hills, Professor of English at Virginia International University. Language is much trickier than you think. In fact, I believe that it's nothing short of miraculous that we communicate half as well as we do. When you think about all the things that go into our language communication that can interfere with understanding, never take language for granted because there is a great deal that can go wrong when one person uses language to communicate with another. We use symbols to communicate with others. And when you really get down to it, yes, we're looking at mathematical symbols here, but all words are symbols and often arbitrary. Think for a moment of the word chair. What does that sound and those letters, chair, C-H-A-I-R, have to do with the object? nothing. We call, could have called chair dog and dog chair. The two things have no bearing on what they are. It's arbitrarily decided and that's how most words are. There is usually no innate connection between an object or thought and the word we use to represent it. Symbols can be ambiguous and let's take a look at a couple of them that are just an example of how symbols are ambiguous. Remember the meanings are in the people not in the words themselves. So if we say Roberto spends a lot of money that is an ambiguous statement because we don't know or necessarily agree what a lot of money might mean. Alicia spends a lot of time working. Again, that is ambiguous. We don't know what that exactly means. The temperature outside is unbearable. Well, literally, it is bearable. But when we say it's unbearable, we're conveying something of our feeling about it. But my unbearable and your unbearable may be quite different. Or that car is too expensive. Again, it depends upon who's saying this and who's hearing it. The meaning is in the people using this language, not in the words themselves. Sometimes we are creative in our ways that we speak with others and are purposely ambiguous. So speakers specifically choose creative ambiguity to mask a message. And here are some examples. If someone says to you, how do you like my new shirt? my new hairstyle, my new car, and let's say you don't like it. What are you going to say to spare the person's feelings? Well, you may say something that is creatively ambiguous, like, it's so original. It's a refreshing change. That doesn't say you like or don't like it. It doesn't really answer the question. It's creatively ambiguous. If someone tells you, I love you, and you do not wish to repeat the sentiment back, again, you may be looking for creative and ambiguous ways to answer that. What did you think of my presentation? Well, it certainly was different, would be a creatively ambiguous answer. Did you have a good time at my party? I couldn't get over the amount of food that you prepared. Now, you're not saying you liked it, but not saying you had a good time. It's creatively ambiguous. Do you like the sweater I bought you? I never had one in that color before. Creatively ambiguous. Isn't my girlfriend beautiful? She is, in fact, quite striking. <laughs> no, striking is ambiguous because she could be striking because she's so ugly. But we're being creatively ambiguous. The denotative meaning of a word is the dictionary definition. But in real communication, we more often are living in the realm of connotative meaning. 
and it includes feelings and emotions that we attach to a word such as the word family. We can look up that word in a dictionary and get a denotative meaning, but when we speak of family, it has certain feelings and emotions attached to that word. For some people, very positive. For others, very negative. Here are examples of connotative meanings. It's cold in here. I'm hungry. You're late. I just painted that chair. You're so funny. Did you notice in all of those we were looking at saying something other than the fact that it's cold or that the chair is painted? We're saying don't sit in the chair. Content level meaning is when we factually interpret the words that are spoken or written. So if your daughter is doing the dishes and you say, I see you did the dishes, you're stating fact. It's the factual meaning. I'm looking at you and you are, in fact, doing the dishes. However, communication goes beyond that. We look at the relationship level of meaning and when we, when we write or speak, we're communicating something about a relationship. This can be particularly ambiguous and can lead to serious misunderstandings. But let's look at that same example. Your daughter's doing the dishes and you say, I see you did the dishes. What you're really saying is, aren't you an angel? Aren't you wonderful? Doing your chores without having to be asked. I am approving of you. I'm reinforcing this behavior. You see, the same exact words, I see you did the dishes, in the factual sense, you're just making a statement of fact, but more often we're speaking in terms of, of feelings about those facts. The influence of language is that language tends to be polarized. We have words for opposing emotional positions, but not for the in-betweens. We say thin and fat, short and tall, new and old, neat and sloppy. And it's very hard to know how to express something in between. We have to therefore have rhetorical sensitivity. We must review all of the available symbols and use the one that is least likely to be offensive to the listener. So drawing upon our discussions from previous lectures in GEC 101, we have to think of things like this. You have an individual, which word would you choose to describe him? Is he a cheap person, a tightwad? frugal, penny-pinching, stingy, thrifty, miserly, economical, they all convey that the guy is not willing to part with his money easily, right? But they each have an emotional attachment to them. If you say to someone that they are economical, that's quite a difference than saying you're a tightwad. Many years ago, I remember going to dinner at a friend's house. It was a, a couple and the husband was a man who was very picky about everything. And without thinking, I said to him, so you're so fussy sometimes. And he was greatly offended. And he said, I am not fussy. I am particular. You see, to him, there was a great difference between those two words. Fussy to him was insulting. Particular was probably flattering. He thought of that as a good trait. So when we're rhetorically sensitive, we don't say things that offend people. We choose from the many available choices the words that are least likely to offend. And as we've discussed in a previous lecture, we have to look out for racist language, including words that denigrate someone of a particular ethnic group. What we don't want in academic writing is anything that smacks of those people, us and them, as in those people don't belong here. That, even without saying anything else, is a put down. We have to watch for religious language creeping into our writing and speech. There's an unfortunate expression that people sometimes use to suggest that somebody negotiated. Rather than saying he negotiated they would, or I negotiated, they would say I jewed him down. This is an offensive remark, obviously, 
and carries with it terrible stereotyping. We have to be very sensitive and not use language such as this in our academic or writing. We have to be careful about cultural language and as we've already alluded to, expressions about oriental people are inappropriate because the term oriental refers to objects while the people are Asian. We also must watch sexist language. Calling a grown woman a girl is sexist. Ask the girl sitting at the front desk. You're saying something negative about women and stereotyping like you throw a ball like a girl. We also these days have to be more sensitive not to assume heterosexist language. So if we say something like, oh, that behavior is so gay, that is extremely offensive and inappropriate. And even when we say, please bring your partner or significant other, this is more sensitive than saying, please bring your wife. Recognizing that people may have someone in their lives who is a partner or significant other, but not a wife. So the language continues to evolve. We also, as we've alluded to, want to avoid the generic he. The professor must turn in his grades by Thursday assumes that unless you know that that professor is a man, that men and women should not be referred to as he. So we want to say the professor must turn in his or her grades by Thursdays, or professors must turn in their grades by Thursday. In both cases, eliminating the assumption that professors are always men. And of course, we want to watch profanity. It has no place in academic writing. It's difficult to keep up with the ever-changing terminology in language. And I can tell you that in my lifetime, there have been tremendous changes. And it can be baffling sometimes to keep up with what's the right thing to say. As I alluded to in a previous lecture, when I was a girl, there were different terms used for African American people. And in my lifetime, I've seen a huge progression through these terms on your left side. I also uh, have seen changes in how we refer to people with physical disabilities. I remember when the term crippled was widely used and it is no longer so. And now we say a person is a wheelchair user, not wheelchair bound. And the native population of the United States, the names we use there have gone from Indians to Native Americans to now Pueblo, Navajo, or other tribes specific. And yet, in the United States, we still have a team that plays American football called the Redskins, a term once used to, define, to describe the people who are native of the United States. And it is a controversial choice to continue to use that name for a sports team, as the term is considered largely by most people to be offensive. And we see on, on regular occasions people protesting the choice of that name for the team. Linguists believe that there are three types of language ambiguity, and I'm going to demonstrate those for you right now. The first is called phonological ambiguity. Phonology is the study of the sound of language. So I can recall an incident when I had a friend many years ago asking me, what are you going to do tonight? Her name was Jill. Laura, what are you going to do tonight? And I said, I'm going to Eatontown. Now, Eatontown was the name of a town nearby where we were living. That was the name of it. I'm, and she thought, I said, I'm going to eat in town. And it led to a very confusing conversation because she then said, I said, I'm going to Eatontown. She said, really, where are you going to go? And I said, to Eatontown. And we went in circles until we realized what was going on. That's because eat in town, the name of a place, and eat in town sound exactly the same in casual conversation. That's phonological ambiguity. And we have many instances where two words sound exactly the same and people are confused by the meaning. The second type of ambiguity is grammatical. If I said to you, don't hit the man with the car, what am I saying? Am I saying, there's a man with a car over there, don't go over there and hit him? Or am I saying, you're driving a car, 
and there's a man over there, don't hit him. You see, we can look at that, we can draw a diagram of the sentence two different ways with two different meanings. But just reading it without doing that diagramming, we don't know what the meaning is. Same with the, the example below. I saw a woman with a telescope. Okay, what did you see? Is it that you take a look across the street and there's a woman who has a telescope? Or are you sitting with a telescope looking through it at a woman? This is grammatical ambiguity. The answer will come when you diagram the sentence and get into what, how the words relate. But in actual use, it leads to ambiguity. And the third kind of ambiguity linguists have identified is semantic. And this is the one with, that is most common. If I say that's a hot car, what do I mean? Is the car running at a high temperature? Well, maybe. Is the car stolen? Now that's a slang expression. We say something that's stolen is hot. Or am I saying that the car is really nice? Because that's an adjective that is used these days to describe things that are really, really attractive. We don't know unless we get more information from the writer or speaker. This is semantic ambiguity. It makes sense grammatically, it sounds right, but we're still confused about the meaning. This concludes the theoretical lecture for week five.